you very much, Joss, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here. And I'm so glad that it wasn't having me having to do the housekeeping announcements because I always forgot to mention fires and anything like that. Um, um, the photograph um, on the screen uh, is, as Joss was saying, part of the um, archives of the, the General Register Office, which is now part of the National Records of Scotland. Um, and I came across it during the centenary commemorations of the First World War. And it's a remarkable um, presentation of a group portrait of colleagues from the distant past. I say distant because it's a century old, but, and certainly no one in the photograph is still alive. Um, but they're not past living memory, and we'll, we'll uh, touch on this a little later on. Um, thanks to former colleagues uh, here for providing me with a copy of the photograph and for other help in getting research into this photograph started back during lockdown, that dim and distant memory. Um, the photograph also featured in a 2017 blog by my former colleague, um, Bruno Longmore, um, and in it he drew attention to the increased employment of women uh, by the year 1921, and we'll see a bit more detail. I didn't realise that's going to be so, quite so small. Uh, we'll see there's lots and lots of women in the picture. Um, there are many more than um, the men. There's 45 women, in fact, uh, compared to only 26 uh, men. But the gender imbalance only tells part of the story um, of this uh, um, period uh, in the office's history. And I want to go on to explore what else is going on in the photograph. Who are these men and women? What did they contribute to the 1921 census? So let's start at the beginning. Um, briefly rehearse the history of this uh, enterprise. Um, censuses in Scotland, England and Wales were sanctioned uh, by Parliament in 1920, and the, the Act is still the basis on which censuses are taken. Uh, in Scotland, the Registrar General was empowered to take the census, and it was agreed that it was vital to hold it on the same day, both north and south of the border. Authorities agreed that the census day would be sat at Sunday, the 14th of April, 1921. And of course, it's well known, as you've no doubt read, that the miners' strikes across Britain derailed the plans to hold it on that day and caused an indefinite postponement. Sunday, the 19th of June, was chosen instead, and the whole administrative machinery was set going uh, to take the census on the new date. A small army of enumerators uh, appointed by the local registrars were uh, created subject to the registrar's approval. Uh, enumer so the registrar general's approval, I should say. The enumerators distributed more than a million schedules to every household, hotel and club, and to all institutions, hospitals, prisons and barracks, ready to be completed on the ninth night of 19th of June. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce the, some of the key staff involved at the heart of this huge operation. In the centre uh, sits uh, James Crawford Dunlop, who's the Registrar General. And as you can see, he's a somewhat formidable looking figure uh, in the centre of the team that he commanded. For many years, uh, he'd been Superintendent of Statistics in Juro and Assistant to the Medical Advisor in the Department of Prisons and Judicial Statistics. Now you get the feeling that he he ate and breathed statistics. He'd, during the war, he had served in the War Office in a statistical capacity. Almost two years after the sudden death of Sir James Patton MacDougall in 1919, Dunlop succeeded him as the Registrar General in January 1921, not really long, for, long before the census was due to be taken. He, he certainly proved to be a very energetic and capable successor. Uh, on his right, on, your, on the left there, um, is Alexander McKinley, who was um, a so-called minor clerk, uh, and he was um, responsible for the statistical side, uh, largely, of, of the work. Uh, not entirely his work, but, but uh, he, he uh, was certainly, I mean, literally his right-hand man, I think, in the, in the, in the enterprise. Like many of the staff, he came from outside Edinburgh, uh, in, in his case, Rothes in Murray. Uh, uh, and a career civil servant, he started as a boy clerk, joined the GRO in 1906, and in 1921 was heavily involved in the processing of the census returns and the creation of the published reports. Um, I should, I was 
Um, so he, um, Scott on the, on the left there is, um, was an illegitimate son of a domestic servant and a coal merchant. And I just want to note that uh, from January 1919 onwards, the, the Scottish uh, registers did not uh, include the word illegitimate uh, in describing children at birth uh, and, uh, and at death as well. So that, that uh, sort of stigma was, was kind of institutionally gradually uh, removed from the registers, although of course it's a very helpful uh, description if you're doing your family history research. Um, The, the Registrar General's staff was far too small, of course, to be able to process the census in, in 1921. So not only were enumerators employed locally, but just like in 1911, temporary staff were recruited to work it, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a pop-up census office. Um, a couple of male clerks came in in early uh, 1921 to help with preparations. Um, I won't go into all the preparations. They were very extensive, uh, involving, for example, uh, working out the new uh, configurations of enumeration districts in, uh, to be as equal in size as possible throughout Scotland. Uh, local changes in government and, and the expansion of towns and cities meant that was a very complicated job. But thankfully, that not, that's not our focus today. Um, from June 1921, the enumeration books and the schedules uh, began to arrive in New Register House. Um, they were stored on specially fitted shelves in the centre of the basement directly below where we are today. Um, the uh, checking began of the enumeration books from the 8,900 8, 8, or so enumeration districts against the schedules from which the enumerations had copied them. This is the difference in the Scottish system. The enumeration books are still being used to transcribe the contents. So if you've been using the, the census records recently, you'll, you'll be aware that these are in fact transcriptions rather than being the household schedules as you would see for the English records. Um, the, the race was on effectively to produce a preliminary report, um, which uh, the Registrar General and his team were very keen to, to work on. It was a matter of honor to do it as fast as, and accurately as possible. Um, it took just one month from census day to table the uh, preliminary report before parliament. Um, and some tables were prepared in duplicate and, check and checked against each other. It's a familiar data input technique even today. Um, the report was dated, uh, was published, sorry, one month later. So in Dunlop's introduction when he presented it to the Secretary for Scotland is dated, dated the 19th of August, 1921. Provisional statistics were aggregated from the summaries made by the registrars from the enumeration books and the report contains a preliminary al analysis of the population figures. Dunrock refers to the postponement caused by the, the, the strikes and what he called the resulting marked effect on local populations, especially seaside and other resorts. Uh, the main problem being, of course, that the, the higher population of holidaymakers in, say, Largs interfered with comparisons with Largs, say, in 1911. Um, these are the figures that uh, Dunlop shared with his opposite number in London on the 4th of August 1921. He began by uh, with the population in 1911, uh, added the increase by births and uh, deaths, balanced off, coming to that total, then um, deducted loss by migration. Um, please don't ask me how that was calculated because that's always a tricky one. Also, the war deaths during the war, the deaths out, out with Scotland. And then that came to an estimated population in 1921 of that figure, 4,883,654. Uh, when they did the census, they discovered it was 4,882,157. That's a difference of only 1,497. So, 0.03%. So um, that's quite accurate uh, predictions, I would say. Um, he was rather pleased with this figure, I suspect, in sharing it with um, Vivian, the Registrar General in London. Uh, Dun Dunlop was always very keen to keep the Scottish end up of things, uh, and uh, I think he was quite pleased. I don't know what the 
the, the error rate in the prediction and the result in England and Wales was. Perhaps someone here will know the answer to that. Um, more detailed analysis of the many questions uh, answered in the census could, of course, only be obtained by the classification of the answers in respect of the 4.8 million inhabitants of the country. Um, classifications in respect of one reply often had to be associated with the classifications in respect of other answers in a multitude of different combinations. For example, replies regarding age need to be grouped together by year, so you need 100 or over 100 groups to arrive at population totals. Replies regarding occupation might include thousands of differing descriptions, each of which are then categorised uh, as one of about 600 prearranged groups of occupation. So combining age and occupation creates thousands of subgroups. And then showing such combinations of age and occupation for different areas creates more groups again. So a very complicated process. Uh, in 1911, they began to use machinery to help with this. And this was repeated in 1921 using electromechanical devices supplied by the stationary office. Um, now, I'm sorry about the slightly peely wally uh, image here. Um, I just wanted to show you that how, if you've noticed um, when you've been looking at the census, I'm sure you've spotted this, that there are codes written in coloured ink, and I'm, it's not really clear the difference here, but these are codes for the in the employer of this person, uh, and here's the occupation. So uh, one of the clerks who joined the office briefly was uh, a chap called Charles James Forbes. He's, this is in Linlithgowshire, West Lothian. Uh, he was a, a shipping clerk. Here's his code 919. And he's written in that he's a worker, uh, but he's then put no occupation since demobilization 14th of February 1921. Uh, so he's a little late in getting demobilized, I have to say, uh, but he also doesn't know how to fill in the form because he should have put, instead of W, a worker, he should have put OW for out of work. And this is a, a key indicator uh, for um, seeing, as we'll, as we'll come across later, for people who are uh, in need of employment. And there, there, was, there were stats, of course, compiled uh, on the basis of, of these returns. So these um, marked up um, sheets were then uh, put into a punching machine. Um, this, this device pictured at the top here. Uh, these were operated rapidly. Um, the operator would key in the, the digits on the co on the upon the card, I should say, uh, oh, sorry, on the taking from the enumeration book and punching in the appropriate code uh, onto the card, um, and that's what a card looks like. This is an example actually from 1911 for England, but it's this. You see the general idea. For a given column, an answer, it's it's rendered into digits here. So here the first one six six uh, zero. Uh, and so forth along the way. So you end up with cards with, with, with holes in them, which can then be read using needles uh, and counted up and so forth, processed from there. Um, you, and so you can, for example, quickly count up uh, the, the number of people living in, say, rooms, uh, houses with rooms no more than, sorry, houses with no more than two rooms, uh, and that, that kind of, uh, Compilation can be made up quite quite quickly by calculating the answers in the relevant column of the card. Um, by September 21, the census office here had received eight sorting machines with tabulating attachments to help process the the data. So these are the Scottish um, cards that were used. Um, the, top, the top one is a, for a personal answer, and then the bottom ones are called area summary cards, which relate to data input for different, um, differently defined uh, areas, um, counties, uh, uh, and so forth. So um, counting machines were used, as I was mentioning. Um, they could count um, the answers in several columns of the cards simultaneously. So that, that sped things up in, enormously. Um, the, it was said by the English Registrar General uh, to his enumerators that the machine could um, be fed in at the rate of 15 to 20,000 an hour, 
and were then disgorged into receptacles according to the answer given. Um, but in practice, um, the machines used here, uh, and they, there's no reason to think they were any worse than the ones used down south, but um, in practice they discovered that the, the, the machines often had mechanical glitches, they paused mid-operation or they stopped altogether. And people had to uh, uh, either restart the batches, rerun the batches because the answer was unreliable, um, or in, in course in some cases the, the cards got wrecked, they were spoiled, damaged by the machine, so they had to be repunched. Uh, so a lot of time was uh, spent uh, putting right things which were going wrong mechanically. Um, it, in Dunlop's own words, he greatly disliked seeing a half idle staff. So he uh, was on the, on, the, on the telegrams and the letters to the stationary office in London and to the manufacturers to get things sorted out. And eventually, uh, I think the solution was really to have a mechanic on the spot for the duration of the, 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 the project. It's effectively like having the, an IT help desk on the spot. They couldn't do without someone to uh, put the machines right, just small tweaks or major, major repairs. Um, that's, the, yeah, that's the sorting machine there. I, please don't ask me how it works exactly, but um, it, they, they, they did uh, get through a power of work when they were functioning properly. Uh, and there's the, the, the third machine that, which is, is the tabulator printer down here. Um, this uh, took sorted cards and counted the totals of the, of, of the columns on the cards at about 4,000 cards an hour. Um, the order of the cards wouldn't be disturbed. And what it did was uh, put the results onto, onto a printed table. It, it spewed out a basic, what I suppose we would call a spreadsheet effectively. And this was then could be taken by the staff and could form the basis for uh, an actual table that was to be published. Um, they, um, they, they ordered a, a whole bunch of, um, of equipment, as I've mentioned, uh, something like uh, 15 to 20 uh, machines, um, including, no, sorry, I'd rather more than that, about 30, I think, uh, including uh, count, basic counting machines and so forth. So it was, a, it was a, a big operation involving all kinds of uh, staff at different levels, and we'll, we'll come on to this. I just wanted to um, divert, because it's a subject of, of, some might say it's very little importance, but actually it's intriguing, um, is where did all this uh, work take place? Um, the original thought at, in 1920 was to have created at least a a large townhouse in Drumshuk Gardens, which is about a mile from here, just beyond the western edge of the new town. Uh, and for some reason, that didn't um, take place. It was always, always going to be a compromise. They were worried about the noise that the machines would take and that would make and that the, the neighbors would complain. Uh, but in, in the end, they didn't need to worry because they uh, decided to build a hut on the green to the west of this building. That's to say, in the, the, yard, the green just outside the Café Royal, between the Café Royal and, and the lane there, where the cherry trees are now in blossom. And this, I know this says 1931, um, but the evidence I've found shows that they definitely built a hut on this site in 21 as well. And I think the reason they built one in 31 is because it worked. Um, now, here we go. This is... Um, there are, not in, there are references to uh, having a fire door um, built at one end of the hut leading onto the green. Um, so I'll just, for the purposes of this, to show you there, there's actually a gate on the, here on the top of the coping stone which opens out and that was reckoned to be a sufficient way out for everybody. Uh, this is the photograph of some of the girls and their supervisor in 1921. And you can see they're sitting uh, in a sunlit spot uh, with at an open door, which I think is the equivalent of this one here. It's a corrugated iron hut, as you can tell, on brick supports. And I think the clincher for me is this tiny detail here. This is the light, the sunlight in the lane outside the Café Royal. The railings here, as you can see, are broad intervals at the top, but at the bottom there's a row of inter-railings, if you like, which are 
make the spacing very narrow and un un unusually narrow. So I think that's exactly what we're looking at there on this side here. Anyway, we'll, um, the huts uh, accommodated all the machines and the, the staff of Girl Punchers, who were at the peak were about 30 of them, with six supervisors. And we're lucky enough to have photographs of the interior of the hut. Um, and this shows, uh, again, I think it shows various machines in situ. We're looking at in two different directions, obviously. And you can see here the windows are open uh, to allow air in. It's presumably the same sunny day when the photograph at the, the doorway was taken. Uh, and if we look down at the far end, there is uh, Henry Allen Scott, one of the minor clerks, uh, with his little, his Charlie Chaplin moustache, uh, just there. But, and it would be nice to be able to identify all the women. We know who the, the, the card punchers were who were kept back, so it might be possible to start to put some names to faces uh, on the basis of the group photograph, but I haven't done that. Um, it would have been a very hot and noisy environment, I think, possibly even in the winter with the clattering of the machines and the heat given off uh, by them and all the bodies crammed into the hut. Um, other people worked in the offices around the building here, uh, but they had um, the convenience of not going far to go and speak to um, their uh, colleagues in the hut itself. Um, now, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the, um, the shift work which went on. They, they worked basically um, three hours on uh, twice a day uh, and with a two hour break in the middle uh, and there were two, two, bat, two groups, so one lot started at eight in the morning, uh, and then the second, the other group, as it were, started at uh, 10 in the morning, I think. Uh, and then, so they had a good interval between the, their shift uh, and uh, to get, get their lunch as well. But they finished, they did start and finish, uh, started early and finished quite late. Um, they worked sort of 44 hours a week, more or less, some down to 42, I'm not quite sure why, possibly uh, upgrading their conditions. Um, but it was, a, it was a long and arduous um, uh, work day, I think. Um, by mid-July 22, uh, most of the card punching had been finished and the, a lot of the staff had been discharged. Um, and this, this is the, the, re the re remaining team who are basically finishing off some of the, uh, the coding and punching of the, uh, uh, of the, of the enumeration books. Um, uh, that's them having their break. Okay, so the, the output um, was the reports um, published, single report published in four volumes between 1922 and 24 almost 3,000 pages of introduction and tables, which is a, a colossal undertaking. Um, this is just one sample of, um, to do with distribution of houses uh, in Scotland by various counties. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a fabulous resource for, for, uh, for historians. Um, it's an interesting thought that they, Neither the Registrar General nor, I suspect, his staff were that interested in what would become of the enumeration books, uh, which, of course, have become the focus of our interest in this day and age. Uh, so they, they, have, they have, as I say, assumed a, a huge importance now. But in a sense, we're, we're um, looking at the, the telescope, through the telescope, the wrong, in a different direction, in a sense, because the... For a long time, the, uh, the published reports were the, the key resource that, that uh, was developed out of all the enumeration books, all the returns of the census, uh, and worked on by these uh, men and women for the best part of two and a half years. Um, obviously, the, the enumeration books allow us to uh, learn more about the lives of these men and women. Um, and of course, the, the, we get that information based 
very very close date to when they actually started work here the, with the, the um, information provided on the 19th of June and many of them beginning uh, their work here in July um, and it, they the, the census returns do give us unique insights into the social background and the lives of the staff. The young women who were card punchers formed the largest group. They're really uh, in the centre, if you like, all this band right through the centre. Uh, they're the second and third rows, uh, the, the, the card punching staff. Um, they all appear to have been young school leavers. The census allows to see them on the 19th of June as scholars, mostly 14 years old. Uh, while the record of the staff gives their starting dates only a fortnight later, in early July. Uh, most of them worked on until uh, mid-late Ju July 2020, uh, 1922, uh, uh, when they were discharged, apart from that lucky group you saw outside the hut. Um, now, it's likely that many of these young women needed to find work. Um, there was a pattern of... of people leaving school early, um, and the education system, it has to be said, was slanted against working class children. So uh, they, they had little incentive to stay on, uh, and more incentive perhaps to leave and, and uh, get work. So that's a big difference between um, then and now. Um, one of these w young women, um, and I've forgotten where she is actually, but I'll just speak about her. She was a, an unemployed clerkess, um, named, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Clark is age 15 when she joined the census office. Uh, her brother-in-law um, had died of wounds during the war uh, and uh, fighting in the McRae's battalion, the 16th uh, Royal Scots. Uh, and she had uh, found work uh, that in, in, in um, July 21, um, having worked as a secretary um, but was not out of work, but she seems to have sh changed jobs to, to join the staff here. Uh, she married in 1929 uh, at the age of 23, uh, and she died the following March after complications in pregnancy, which is uh, a sadly a common occurrence. I'll just show you, she's actually, she's this woman here. So um, another woman who is not identified, um, uh, Miss R. Smith, um, was well thought of. We can see her progressing through in her career, her short career here. She started to help proofread the reports, which was obviously a trusted occupation, and she got promotion in May of 23 to being a temporary clerkess. So she got more pay uh, and uh, benefited from that. Um, but her subsequent career isn't known, and because I haven't found her first name, um, that remains to be identified. And I should just say that we'd be delighted, I'd be delighted, and I know my colleagues here would be delighted if um, anybody can identify uh, people in the photograph. Um, you may have seen uh, that the bottom of the full image, every single person is named, but with only with their initials and surname. So it's quite difficult in some cases to work out who they were. As you can imagine, with a common surname, and a common initial for, uh, for a forename. So um, I wanted to move on now to someone called Mina Pringle. She was Williamina Murrell Pringle, known as Mina in her family. Uh, her siblings were all in clerical jobs at the time of the 1921 census. And she's uh, here in the center of this group, <coughs> uh, aged, uh, I think by then, she joined at 15, which is pretty, I think this is a year later or so, so she's now 16. Uh, I'm indebted to Derek Johnson, who's here today. Thank you, Derek, very much for supplying this lovely uh, family group, which is beautifully colorized, which is something that's far beyond my capabilities. Uh, and I think Mina is the one sitting here on the, at the end. Um, this is taken, I think Derek thinks at Preston Pans. I think, is that correct? Yes, I think possibly. Okay. Um, anyway, it's just very nice to be able to link um, someone in the photograph to uh, an actual uh, living relative. Um, and he, uh, Derek also pointed out to me that um, another relative of his was uh, a clerk in the Satian's office called John Malcolm, whom I knew because he features in the role of honor in the First World War. And it's possible that um, if 
Mina didn't hear about the jobs on offer here any other way. She might have heard it through, um, through her relation, um, uh, uh, John Malcolm, who himself was a, was a war veteran. Um, okay. Now, we can move on to the Clarkesses. Um, they're, they're, some of them are clustered in front of the, the card-punching staff here. Uh, some of them are here, another one there. Um, and they, they came with, with more experience. They would tend to be slightly older. Um, for example, Barbara Forsyth Sangster, who's on the extreme left here, I think. I think she's this one here, of the collar. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, no, she's actually the one sitting in front of her. <laughs> there we go, just at the end of the row. Um, Barbara Sangster had been a clerkess uh, keeping the books at Black and Company in Shanwick Place. But in, ju in June 1919, at the age of almost 25, she was out of work, just like her youngest sister, a shorthand typist. The middle sister was working as a shop assistant. The six members of their household were squeezed into three rooms in their Haymarket flat, which was not a, an uncommon uh, situation. Um, many, uh, most, many of the the lower rank staff were, were living in, in flats of, uh, with only two or three rooms, with, with quite a few per room. Um, the Registrar General got 12 uh, of the clerkesses via the employment exchange, uh, and there was a thing called the professional women's section on the register that the exchange kept. So I think some of, some of the women we're looking at here were probably in that category. Um, the one at the end here, uh, We'll come to in a moment, but there's also um, just want to talk about the necessity for work. Someone called Sarah Scally, who's not in the photograph, but was one of the women who came from the exchange, um, was a was a 30 year old unemployed clerkess. Um, she lived in a large house in Warriston Crescent down at Cannon Mills, which was eight, with eight rooms for five people, which was comparatively luxurious. Uh, it included their retired father but the eldest of the three daughters was a shorthand typist and it seems reasonable to guess that Sarah needed the work in the census office to bolster the household income. Um, it wasn't always approved of uh, women in, in work uh, particularly after the war and there's a whole area here to discuss about uh, the way in which uh, women were forced out of their posts that they had during the war uh, and even in the civil service uh, their uh, opportunities were thwarted, shall we say. Um, none of the um, women here got a permanent appointment other than a typist um, who's at the other end of this front row. Um, and so that, that whole idea of the equal opportunities that arose from the Act of 1918, um, which allowed people, women to join the professions, really didn't come to fruition in Register House uh, for many decades. Um, now, I mentioned Alice McKinley, she's here. Um, she's no relation to uh, Alexander McKinley, who can, whose face you can just see kicking out there on, the, on just beside her. Um, she was um, one of the more important clerkesses, judging by her position in the photograph. Um, her father, in fact, was a senior civil servant in the Exchequer Office and was probably known personally or by reputation to senior staff here in, 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 the, in the Registrar General's office. So the young women who succeeded in getting these 12 posts no doubt did well interview and had the right skills and experience and good references, but it's not unreasonable to uh, suggest that it didn't harm a candidate's chances if they were well connected, if they knew the right people who might have a word in the ear. Um, I'm not suggesting that Alice McKinley was one of those, but the fact that her father was a senior civil servant is indicative at least that she had a better than uh, even chance of, of joining the staff. Um, there were various family connections in, in the register houses among the staff, um, which probably operated to assist people who were in low level temporary positions, not the permanent ones which were done, were filled by examination and so on. So um, ostensibly, uh, free of, uh, of personal influence and, and um, recommendation. Okay, let's move on. Um, 
the clerks. Um, these are some of the chaps from the top left-hand corner of the image. Um, they were mostly ex-servicemen, ex as far as I can make out, um, the ones I've identified so far, uh, and I haven't identified all of them yet. Um, some of them were involved, got, got actually got permanent positions here as a result of their work. One or two of them sitting in the front row. We'll come back to them later on, we'll see them. Um, uh, others where it came and went, essentially. For, they came for a year or maybe 18 months, some, in some cases as much as two years before leaving. Um, many of them had been on active service overseas and at least some of them had probably seen action. Um, standing in the back row, second from left, is this here, Samuel Ronald Mackay, uh, a London-born career soldier who'd risen to be a regimental quartermaster sergeant in the King's Own Scottish Borderers. He is about 48 eight years old in the photograph, but he looks older, perhaps because of his war experiences. Um, uh, he was posted to France in May 1915, and on the 25th of September, he fought at the famous Battle of Luce, which is uh, depicted on this illustration from the Illustrated London News on the left. Uh, Mackay was in the 6th Battalion, this is the famous Piper Laidlaw, uh, who uh, piped, famously piped uh, his uh, comrades uh, into battle. Uh, he was in the 7th Battalion elsewhere on the battlefield, but it just gives a flavour of the, uh, the, the, uh, the chaos uh, and um, unpleasant uh, conditions of the, of the battle. You, the, the, the soldiers are wearing gas masks here, as you can see, protective hoods over their faces. Um, Laidlaw won the Victoria Cross. Uh, Mackay was wounded in the battle uh, and um, his, his battalion was involved in an assault in the northern sector of the battlefield near the formidable German strong point known as the Hohenzollern Redoubt. Uh, battalion, in fact, fault, the attack uh, faltered in the face of withering German defensive fire. Um, regimental history records that Mackay uh, was wounded while doing splendid work. Uh, now, uh, the nature of his, industry, of his injury, <coughs> excuse me, the nature of his injury uh, is mentioned in the pen pension ledgers which are available on, through Ancestry. That's the loss of an left eye and it explains why he's turned half away from the camera. Uh, in 1917, he married in Edinburgh and he transferred to the Royal Army Service Corps. Soon after the armistice, when registering his first, first daughter's birth, he describes himself as an electrical engineer's clerk, as well as a regimental quartermaster sergeant. Uh, in June 1921, the census records him as acting barrack warden of the army barracks at Piers Hill, just past Jock's Lodge, which many of you will know, uh, here in Edinburgh. Uh, where he was living with his wife and two young girls. Um, he started at work as a clerk in the census office much later than most of the other staff, and he only worked for six months and from January to July 22. Um, but uh, Dunlop felt very sorry for him when, uh, when it, his time came to, to, to leave, and he referred him, refer, asked his colonel of the, uh, the colonel of the officers' association, Colonel Blair, uh, who, who he describes as being uh, his, uh, Mackay was his protege. Uh, he, he hoped that Blair would find him some, some work. Um, going back to them, um, some of the chats came from the Sacian office next door. Um, they worked as engrossing clerks, as casual clerks uh, who did piecework copying or engrossing, as it was called, uh, Sacians and other documents in the official registers. And after the war, the engrossing clerks were being phased out as typists were introduced, who were cheaper and faster. Um, so there's, I think, seven of the chaps came here. Um, Henry McCabe, who is along here, was one of these uh, uh, engrossers. He was even older than Mackay, um, born in 1873, the son of a printer's warehouse man, um, which is a reminder that the print trades formed of Edinburgh's dominant industry. Uh, Henry worked as a clerk in 1911 uh, for an auctioneer uh, and he and his wife 
with, had no children, but they lived in a one-room flat in Thistle Street at the back of George Street. The pension cards tell us that uh, Henry McCabe served in the Army Pay Court during the First World War. And here he is. Again, I've just enlarged him up, and he has got the best eyebrows. Um, this is courtesy of um, someone I got in touch with through a family tree posted on Ancestry uh, called Eric Riswick, and I'm grateful to him for it, to being able to share this with you. Um, you can see on his cap the letters APC, uh, uh, which stands for the Army Pay Corps, uh, as well as his sergeant stripes. Now, being a military veteran experienced in dealing with numbers would have made him a, a very suitable choice to join the census staff, but his work in the Sasin office as an engrossing clerk would have been a, an extra recommendation, I think. Um, he worked on the census for about a year. Um, what he did next is unknown, but his census work may have helped him find suitable work. In 1955, his death entry stated that he was a retired auditor's clerk. Um, another veteran uh, uh, who was in, uh, for also in the Army Pay Corps and, from, and went through the Sasian office, not in the photograph, uh, he became a commercial traveller um, at the time. You know, he was working as that by the time of his death in 1927. Um, the pattern of temporary work in the post-war years um, fits it very much into the context of the economic downturn that began in 1921 and was no doubt a, a reason why people were so pleased to be able to get at work uh, in, the, in the census office. Um, the, fortunately, the evidence of the Sasian staff records allows us to see evidence of this pattern of uncertain employment. I should say the census staff records, rather. Um, the 1931 census staff are better documented, and the entries include helpful details of previous employment. Um, many of the men in their 40s and 50s were veterans of the Great War, so they were still being found work in 31. Uh, and among the temporary 1931 staff were two men and four women who had worked on the 21 census here. Um, the, this shows the, the difficulties, perhaps, uh, in finding steady work in the white collar sector during the 1930s. I'll just give you one example of a man who fought in the Royal Scots during the war, um, who served here between 21 and 22. Um, he moved on to the Customs and Excise in Leith for five years. <laughs> then to the Scottish Command, that's the Army, Scottish Army Command pay office for a year, to the Inland Revenue for a month, to the Ministry of Labour, three weeks, Inland Revenue again, four months, Inland Revenue in Gala Shields for four months, and then finally Inland Revenue in Edinburgh for six weeks before rejoining the uh, Census Office here. Um, also, just wanted to mention a chap at the back here in the arch of the doorway there, um, uh, Frederick uh, Wink. Um, he'd served during, in the Royal Army Medical Corps during the war, and he was now in his mid-50s. He was probably the best qualified of the temporary recruits uh, to the census office staff. The census reveals that he was an out-of-work insurance clerk with the Equitable Life Assurance Company. And he, he went on to compile the tables for... Uh, a publication of the Scottish Life Tables, presented by Dunlop to the Faculty of Actuaries in 1923. Dunlop wrote uh, of his desire to acknowledge the valuable assistance given to me by Mr. F. A. Wink, a member of staff of the General Registry Office and formerly an actuarial student. He has carried out the calculations in a most painstaking and accurate manner, and I have adopted them with full, with full confidence. So that gives a flavour of the expertise that was gathered around Dunlop um, three, per, three ones we've mentioned already. Next to them, a chap called James Candlish Young, the dapper man in a suit. He, he supervised the girls in the, in the, in the hut. Uh, and then either side of them are chaps who became uh, clerks, who got permanent jobs here. And then I did mention um, the typist. This is Isabella McKinnon, who was obviously very good uh, and got kept on, kept on getting her contract extended, as it were, and she eventually got a permanent position uh, and uh, carried on working in a different branch of the, I think she went to the deeds office as a supervising typist later on. Um, Young uh, 
so Young and Scott, um, next to the two of them, both rose to be uh, secretaries of the Red General Register Office here, in effect, second command to the Registrar General. And McKinley there uh, retired as chief statistical office and in private life had discovered that he was a distinguished Baptist lay preacher serving as the president of the Baptist Union of Scotland. Um, having overseen the 1921 census and published its results in four volumes, Dunlop um, in the centre there helped prepare the next census, but perhaps luckily he turned 65 in 1930, so he retired before having to lead a second census. Uh, in 1931, under a new Registrar General, uh, uh, Andrew Froude, McKinley and Scott once again played a key role, but that is another story. So, I uh, just want to ask quickly, uh, end by quickly, by just um, addressing the question <laughs> you've perhaps been forming in your minds, why, where is this photograph taken and why and when? So, uh, some of you may recognise the north front of George Herriot's hospital, the school, uh, and the date we can work out from the dates of service of the staff is somewhere around June 22, I think, uh, because a lot of the, the girls in the centre here had left by uh, mid to late July. And why was it taken? Well, I think it was probably, uh, Dunlop probably wanted a record of, of his team. But I do wonder, having, it only just occurred to me that um, with the, f the very smart formal gear, um, there may have been an actual social event coupled with this photograph. Who knows whether they had tea in the hall of Harriet's, but I, I don't know, that's something to be discovered. But anyway, I, I leave that hanging there and uh, thank you very much for listening.